to invite Professor Lubavitch back to Ache Shalom. This is now the third um, series she has taught here, so now it's a Chazaka, so it's yeah. like a real part of our uh, tradition, and uh, so eager for you again to teach us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm really excited to teach you tonight about the, it really is not a discovery of the Geniza, because by the time in 1896, Solomon Schefter entered the Geniza in December, people did already know about it. So I can be very um, fantastical and I can, you know, make this big dramatic story about how Solomon Schefter discovered the Cairo Geniza. But first of all, that would be pretty insulting to the Jews of Fustat in, uh, in Cairo, the old Jewish section of Cairo, who knew about this Geniza since the 9th century. And over the centuries, many scholars did know about the Geniza. But what we're going to talk to you uh, tonight is, um, is about how Salman Schachter emptied the Geniza and brought it to Cambridge. And so um, we're going to start in 1896 with, I just had to add a joke because it's so um, unlikely, two identical twin sisters, Presbyterian twin sisters from Scotland who approached Salman Schachter in May of 1896. And this was a time to understand what happens when they walk into Solomon Schachter's office. And Schachter is very old school, whatever old school meant in 1896, very old school Romanian rabbi, knew many, many, many languages. English was probably his fourth, maybe fifth language. Brilliant man who had come um, in his 20s. He had come to England to tutor uh, a scholar named Claude Montefiore. I don't know if you know the Montefiore family, a very great. British Jewish family, and he had come to tutor him, and he had been brought on recently to be a reader in rabbinics. That means like an assistant professor of rabbinics at Cambridge University. And one day, May 1896, two identical twin sisters walk into his office. So in order to understand what happens here, we have to know a little bit about what's happening in the late 19th century. So this was a time where it was totally acceptable to go to what was called the Orient and treasure hunt. And people, especially people of means, living in um, in England or under um, England's colonies uh, um, in Australia or South Africa or India or, or um, Americans also did this. They would go and they would try to find treasures. But it wasn't just about finding cool things. It was about legitimizing their own traditions. And so I'm trying to find something to lean on because I'm used to having a stender, but I don't want to ruin this one. Thank you. Okay. So these women were very, very thrilled. And conveniently, <laughs> they were widows. So they had both married uh, around the same time. And it's very, very strange, these two women, Margaret, Margaret Dunlop Gibson and Agnes Smith Lewis, basically similar things happened to each of them at the same time. They married two scholars, two different guys, not related to each other, but they're both intellectuals, and they both die of terrible diseases in their 20s. And Margaret and Agnes find themselves independently wealthy and without children and without a husband. And so they devote their lives to um, traveling and to studying and to uh, analyzing religious texts. And actually, we're not going to talk about tonight, but Agnes Smith Lewis especially was a great, great scholar, and her specialty was uh, an Aramaic language, a dialect called Syriac. And Syriac, some people are nodding, Syriac is the language that Christians use in the second, third, and fourth centuries. And uh, Agnes Smith Lewis went to the Sinai Desert in the 1890s, and she went to a very famous monastery, an ancient monastery called St. Catherine's Monastery. And it was there that she found what's called the Syriac Sinaiticus. This is a fourth century, one of the oldest Bibles in the world. She discovered it, meaning she saw the codex, realized this was very ancient, published it, and she got many honorary doctorates. So she was a legitimate scholar, really a very, very well known in her day uh, and for perpetuity. And so these women, like many others who were wealthy and had mobility and were very pious and religious, uh, invested a lot of time and a lot of money to traveling all over the world to find religious artifacts. And the idea was that these artifacts would somehow support their very fervent religious beliefs. So in the Presbyterian case, that would be um, anything that would support the fact that Jesus walked you know, through the lands of the Galilee and preached and, and uh, influenced various communities lying along the Mediterranean. So this is what they did. 
did. And they went to Palestine, and they went to uh, Rome, and they went to ancient Alexandria in Egypt, and they went to uh, Antioch in uh, modern-day Syria, and they went to all these places. And they picked up languages, and their Greek was very, very good, so they were able to read Greek, Syriac, Latin, and Hebrew. And on one of their trips, in 1892, they're in Cairo, and they're walking along um, a, a commercial area, and there were, um, as you walked along, there were people who tried to sell you goods. And an antiquities dealer approached them. These are two very refined looking women who, you know, look like well dressed, that they have money. And an antiquities dealer approached them. This is how the story goes. And said, I have something very ancient, very precious. Do you want to see it? And they said, Of course we do. And uh, what the antiquities dealer showed them was a little torn up piece of um, parchment, a little, little ripped piece of paper, and it had Hebrew on it. It looked very ancient to them, but they didn't know what it was, and they didn't know whether it was um, really authentic, because of course, uh, at this time, and today also, this is a very big problem, when you have a very uh, successful antiquities market, you also have very successful forgers. And so they didn't know whether this was authentic. So when they came back to Cambridge, they said, there's only one person in Cambridge, perhaps in all of England, who can take a look at this tiny little fragment, this little piece of paper, and tell us what it is and what it means. And that person is on the chapter. Okay, I have to find my, all right. I'm not well versed in the art of PowerPoint. Okay, Solomon Schechter. See, I wanted to give you to the up close picture. But see, I like this picture because he, first of all, because he's light eyes. You can see they're very intense, very intense eyes. This is more the formal, right? He's fancy. He's a professor at Cambridge. By the time that this portrait was taken, you know, he was very well known. You can see he looks very serious. But this is the personality that I like to see. So Solomon Schechter's in his office. And, uh, and he's approached in May of 1896 by Agnes Smith-Lewis and Margaret Dunlop-Gibson. We'll get to this impossible to read <coughs> photograph in a minute. And, um, and he wrote about this moment later. He says that when he was given this little parchment, he felt that he was going to pass out. That's how he felt. And you're talking about a person who uh, had an encyclopedic knowledge of early rabbinic, early Jewish literature. Schechter knew early Jewish literature, I'm not just talking about Talmud and, and, and Midrash, I'm talking about the entire corpus of Jewish literature, biblical Jewish literature. He knew it so well that he was able to automatically translate from one language to another, and he knew, backwards and forwards, a Greek text called Ben Sira. This was a text, a wisdom text written in the 2nd century BC that had only survived in Greek, but it was definitely a Jewish text. And he knew this text, backwards and forwards. And when he saw this little parchment, he immediately identified it as a Hebrew version of Ben Sira. And this is the moment, really, that the Cairo is discovered, because he realizes this came from someplace that he needs to know more about. But in order to appreciate what does it mean to find a Hebrew version of Ben Sira, we have to back up. This was a big argument between Protestants, between Christian scholars, mainly in Germany, and, uh, and a few Jewish scholars. The question of what was the original language of Jewish documents in the Second Temple literature? And a lot was at stake here. Because in the 1880s, 1890s, even through the first half of the 20th century, there was a dominating approach to early Judaism on, on uh, the part of scholars who felt that Judaism was in decline. Starting from the exile, the end of the exile, so the, the Babylonian exiles between 587 and 539 BC, right, the numbers are going down. The Jews in the early Persian period are allowed to go back and rebuild their second temple after the exile. But scholars felt really that from the time that the Jews started going back, uh, so this is called the post-exilic period, things are really in decline. And Judaism becomes increasingly ritualistic and increasingly obsessive with um, legalism. And again, I, I'm not telling you things that are true. I'm telling you the approach to Judaism, right? So we have to be careful here. Uh, and they would say, you know, the Jews were obsessed with mikvahs and purity and all these things. They had the shell of this legalistic system that they were developing. They were hardening the shell, but they weren't getting to the substance of Jews and they lost the ethical concern. They had lost the, um, the moral, the, the feel, the heart of Judaism. 
And uh, it was very convenient for Christian theologians to say this, because what happens in the first century is that Jesus swoops in and saves the day, right? And then he says, I'm going to set aside all that legalism, and I'm going to um, introduce you to a covenant of the faith, right? You can enter into this covenant not through works, not through halakha, not through circumcision, but through faith in me, right? And so there's a false dichotomy. Uh, that is developed, and that dichotomy is that Judaism is obsessed with legalism, it's particularist, it's ritual, right? And, uh, and Christianity is universalist, Christianity is ethical, it's concerned with good deeds, right? And so uh, Schaeffer was very sensitive to this dichotomy, and texts like Ben Sira that reflect a lot of um, Greek philosophical thought. On the one hand, Ben Sira emphasizes purity, and it is a very legalistic text. There is a lot of interesting halachic material in Ben Sira, but at the same time, it's clearly um, written by someone who was aware of Hellenist thought and philosophical schools like the Stoics and the Cynics. And there are certain buzzwords in Ben Sira that really seem to be philosophical buzzwords. And scholars said this could not, uh, Christian scholars said, this could not have been written in Hebrew. There's no way. Because a Jew speaking and thinking and writing in Hebrew would never have been able to come up with a document like this. It has to have been written by more of a Hellenized Jew, someone who really had exposure to the Greek world. And Schefter said, no, there is no dichotomy here, right? There were Jews, things were in the air, right? Like today, you might have someone who's Jewish who doesn't speak any Hebrew, right? An American Jew living in Chicago, but very pious and very spiritual and very connected to their identity, and you might have a Jew living in Tel Aviv who goes to the shellfish, the trade shellfish restaurant down the street every night, right? And that is normal, that's our world, and it's the same thing in the ancient world. There were Jews in Alexandria who spoke only Greek, right? Philo did not know Hebrew, very pious. There were Jews uh, who spoke um, other languages, but uh, very, very connected to their tradition. And so Schechter always believed, before Agnes Smith Lewis and Margaret Dunlop Gibson came into his office, he had always held publicly, and he wrote about this, that Ben Sira and other texts that are thought to, or were thought to have been written in Greek were actually written in Hebrew. But he didn't have any manuscriptal proof for it. He just felt it in his guts. He felt that the argument that these had to have been written by Hellenized Jews, by Hellenized Jews it didn't work for him. It didn't make sense to him. And he, um, he was shocked and very, very excited when he saw this little piece of paper that looked like not a translation of the Greek, but an original version of Ben Sira. And this would, by the way, be an ongoing debate. Scholars said, all right, so you have this Hebrew version of Ben Sira, but that must have been written as a translation of the Greek later, right? And, um, and Schefter says, no, absolutely not. And actually, anyone who knows Ben Sira knows that in the introduction, the opening lines are, I am the grandson of this priest, Sira, who wrote this text in Hebrew and I'm translating it. So it's pretty good. Uh, also, uh, I mean, there are, now there's more manuscriptal evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we have more information. And of course, uh, in rabbinic literature, Ben Sira is cited in Hebrew. So it's not a canonized text, it's not part of the Bible, but there is enough evidence to argue that at least some rabbis thought this was an authoritative text because they quote it as an authoritative text. Interesting. When was the canon concretized is a very fun question, uh, and most scholars think it was late then. We assume. Okay, so, um, so he, he basically wants to faint, right? It's May 1896, he sees this little parchment, and he says, oh my god, this is, where did this come from? And they say, we got this from a dealer in, uh, in the Jewish area of Cairo, in, in Fustat, and he says it's very ancient, and he says, yes, it is, this looks extremely, extremely ancient. And he's so excited that he, he writes, um, a few days later, he writes a postcard. Now, you can't, you can't really read it. But do you see my arrow? <laughs> you see the original Hebrew of Ecclesiasticus. At first, Ecclesiasticus is Ben Sira. At first, he suspects that this is the original version of Ben Sira. But he says, I need a couple days to examine it. And then he sends Agnes Smith Lewis and her sister a postcard and says, yes, this is definitely, I have no question in my mind, this is authentic, this is real, and I need to go to Egypt and find more of this. And so here you can, you can kind of see the word fragment, I don't know, because this is not such a big screen, you see fragment of 
the original Hebrew of these Isaac. He's telling her that he's going to investigate more and he's going to go to Egypt, and he does that to some So he's very, very excited. And he goes to what's called the Ben Ezra Synagogue of Cairo. This is an early medieval synagogue. And uh, <clears throat> you see very beautiful interior. This is not the original structure. It, went, it underwent re renovations right before, in the 1880s and 1890s, it underwent renovations. It's not the original structure. But there was a synagogue there. And <clears throat> the interior dates back to the early medieval period. So the Geniza, the this uh, stored attic room that you could only get uh, get to with, by uh, putting a ladder against the wall, climbing up, and there's literally a square at the top of the wall, and you climb through it. That dates back to the early medieval period. One of the most interesting things about the Geniza um, that Schefter discovered when he came there in December 1896 is that he found about 250,000 different documents. <laughs> Ta-da! Because, you know, we think of the Geniza as like neat piles of like folders. <laughs> um, that's all collated and labeled. So, one of the interesting things is that so much of the Geniza is not scriptural, does not even have God's name on it. And we think of the Geniza today as being somewhere maybe um, in a Jewish cemetery, right, or in a Jewish synagogue, maybe in the basement, maybe in the attic, right? We think of the Geniza as being a place where you put documents with God's name, right? That's just not the case with the Cairo Geniza. The Cairo Geniza has uh, Hebrew documents, but many of them are just documents, contracts, personal letters. Some of those personal letters are written by Maimonides, so kind of important, but some of them aren't. And poetry by famous uh, Paitanim, such as Yanai, you might have heard of Yanai. Uh, and so we have a huge corpus of different documents that uh, Schechter came in there and he was just overwhelmed in December of 1896. And uh, he realized right away that this is not going to be uh, a simple task, first of all, to uh, to get things out of the Geniza, bring back to Cambridge and study. And forget the fact that he doesn't, he, walk, he crawls into this Geniza and he doesn't know where Ben Sira is, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing he's dealing with. It's not like, all right, well, let's go to the B call number, right? Uh, no, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't know where, where Ben Sira is. He went to Fistat and he asked people on the street, where could an ancient uh, piece of parchment have come from? And he spent about three weeks uh, in Cairo, talking to the Jewish community, and pretty much everyone told him the best bet is that even if it didn't come from the Cairo Geniza, if you want to study more ancient texts like that one, go to the Geniza. But it took him most of those three weeks to endear himself to the Beadle, to endear himself to the Shamash of the synagogue, to build their trust, to build a personal relationship. And they had been very suspicious of scholars who had tried to enter the Geniza before him. In fact, Schechter wasn't the first person who tried to get into the Geniza. There are a few others. I'm not really going to be focusing on them tonight, but I don't know if you've heard of Abraham Berkovich, who's very controversial because he was a Jewish antiquities dealer who was a Karaite and uh, a, a Lithuanian Karaite who also, all these people had agendas. When you're trying to find ancient religious relics, you're not just an objective you're not spending your time and your money on just like finding cool stuff, right? So there's a Karaite who, who was trying to prove that Karaites are descendants of the Ten Lost Tribes, and he had um, apparently gotten some precious documents through shady means, and so they knew about Berkovich, they knew about someone named Jacob Safir, who wrote a, a, a travelogue, a, a story of his travel adventures called Evan Sapir, which was very, very popular at the end of the 19th century, about uh, his adventures to the Orient and finding ancient Jewish manuscripts. So it was cool to do this, right? Whether you were a Presbyterian identical twin sister or whether you were a Jewish scholar, it was like very in vogue to try to find these texts. And so people knew about the Geniza, but what the success of Schefter is that he was not going to give up. He was not leaving Cairo until he had some sort of ongoing access um, to the Geniza. We don't exactly know how he achieved this, but at some point, the, um, the, the rabbi and the shamash of the synagogue said, we trust you, we like you, you're a good guy, um, take what you want from the Geniza. And the way Schefter tells it, uh, he says, as a matter, I don't think I included this text, but they said, 
take what you like, and Schechter says, as a matter of fact, I liked it all. <laughs> it's a very famous sign. Have you heard the sign? It's very famous, right? So he takes it all. Right? It ends up being not just a lifetime of work for Schechter, it ends up being a century's worth of work. And actually, I'm excited to be giving uh, this lecture now because really only the past year has the Geniza been digitized. So I mean, it's unbelievable. It's still, it's still ongoing, but you can see almost everything online. And actually, my last slide is the website. Although it's easy to Google, Karen is online. Okay, so here we just have this jumble um, of documents. And so I just want to put a pause on uh, the PowerPoint and look at some of these texts. So just to backtrack and, um, and highlight really how, how unbelievable this discovery was. And by the way, as somebody who studies ancient texts, I kind of feel like the Cairo Geniza gets the short shrift because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Once the Dead Sea Scrolls were uh, discovered the 11 caves in the northwestern corner of the Dead Sea between 1948 and 1953, right? Once the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered, I was like, oh, the Geniza, you know, nobody cares about the Geniza anymore because the Dead Sea Scrolls, ooh. I think it's just that whoever came up with the term the Dead Sea Scrolls knew that it was like really titillating, like, ooh, mysterious Dead Sea. <laughs> uh, but, but, the Cairo Geniza is way more important. I hate to use a qualitative term. I don't really hate because it's true. The Cairo Geniza is just more important for our understanding of Jewish history in the sense that it's preserving over a thousand years worth of documents that span a wide variety of genres, right? Halachic and personal and poetic and literary and come from all over, not just Egypt, but documents ended up there that were from all other places in Europe. So we have a, not just a tiny sliver of Jewish life in the ancient world. We have a massive corpus of evidence for how Jews lived between the 9th century and the 19th century. And the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, that, uh, that sect, God bless them, we were talking about a 1st century BCE, 1st century CE, um, separatist sect who moved to the community because they didn't like how the temple administration was going in Jerusalem. And, um, and they represent, if these are the Essenes, and we don't know for sure, a couple thousand Jews. Josephus says 3,000 Jews, maybe 4,000 Jews in the first century C. So okay, that's great, good, you know, it's, I'm so happy we discovered the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the Cairo Geniza really has kind of lost its sheen because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I want to bring that sheen back because the Karagiza is so cool. Okay, and, and Schechter agrees with me, so therefore I have backup. So Schechter writes to his friend, this is before he gets uh, to the Geniza, but he has just discovered this text. And he writes to his friend, this is a judge who lives in Philadelphia, my hometown, Mayor Salzberger, and he writes a letter, we have his letters um, to Salzberger, and so you can see the excitement, and also the frumkite, well, just really, really pious. I mean, and you could also see right away he knows what's at stake. Remember I told you that he doesn't see this as just a cool discovery. He sees this as a way to take down anti-Semitic Christian scholarship. And, and this is still ongoing today. I mean, even today I read scholarship about post-exilic prophetic literature uh, and how prophets in the uh, post exilic period are fighting against the ritualistic priests as if there's this dichotomy. That's just bad scholarship. I mean, that's, you don't, no, really, you don't have um, substantive evidence for that dichotomy. And scholars, even today, still, still assume there was a priests versus prophets fight in the ancient world. I mean, I, I don't see that dichotomy um, unless you impose it onto the text. Okay, so Schachter writes to his friend, what does he say? I met yesterday, right away he writes his letter, I, I, I met yesterday with a piece of good fortune of which many a biblical scholar will be jealous. I have namely discovered, and by the way, if you're curious, he's writing in English, not his first language, but he has beautiful English. I have namely discovered among the fragments with which Mrs. Lewis, the discoverer of the Syriac Gospel, remember I told you she found that fourth century Syriac Codex, brought from her last journey in the Orient, that it was okay to say Orient. <laughs> a leaf from the Kibu Sirach, Ecclesiastes, that's his parentheses, not mine. As you know, was the original of the Apocrypha in the Hebrew. Okay, so in other words, uh, we have the Hebrew Bible, 24 books of the Hebrew Bible, and then the Bible was translated to Greek in the third century BC, and that's known as the Septuagint. And as we uh, have it now, the Septuagint came to include 
another 15 documents that are not in the Hebrew Bible. Those documents are called the Apocrypha, and they're part of the Catholic canon. So they're authoritative in the Catholic canon, not in the Protestant canon. Okay? And Ben Sira is one of those documents. So it's Apocrypha, you can say Apocrypha today. And the Gaonin even cite passages from it. Remember I mentioned rabbinic literature cites Ben Sira, it's there too. But it is now for the first time that we have a fragment coming from the body of the book. I am now transcribing the manuscript. And shall have a mirza shen, that's the front right there. Write a monograph on the subject which I hope you will receive soon. And this is unbelievable. It's like live, it's like a live feed. It's like a Facebook live feed, right? We have uh, a letter that Shekhar writes the day after the, um, the Scottish twin Presbyterian identical sisters, right? <laughs> I have to say all the adjectives because it's cool. But, uh, after they visit him, right? I mean, this is really incredible. He goes to the Cairo Geniza, and, um, and he does get more leaves of Ben Sira. Now, the question is, is it part of the same manuscript, right? Unclear. <clears throat> but he's able to get a Hebrew um, manuscript of Ben Sira that he publishes. And in his article, he introduces the Hebrew version of Ben Sira. And that's source number two. He writes in the expositor, for this fragment, we are indebted to, this is my insertion, Agnes Smith, Lewis's, and uh, there should be an and there, Margaret Dunlop Gibson's last journey in Palestine and Egypt, in which countries they have acquired various Hebrew manuscripts, mostly in fragments. Now this is, I personally think that this is a, uh, what's the phrase when you try to throw someone off your trail? Some, or like throw off the scent. I don't know what the phrase is. Diversion. Yeah, but diversion. It, it's, it's all of that. It's all of that. You're all right. Our fragment was found in the Palestine bundle, among other leaves of Hebrew, Hebrew manuscripts, extending over various branches of Jewish literature, as Bible, Mishnah, Talmud, liturgy, grammar, etc. Now, it's almost certain, 99% certain, that the sisters told him it came from Cairo, because he goes to Cairo that same year. So why does he publish an article that says this fragment was found in the Palestine bundle? As soon as the, the existence of a Geniza that held ancient treasures came to light in a really very public way, there was a big race. There was a big race, especially between Schechter and a, a Protestant scholar, not from Germany, but from uh, England, a professor at the University of Oxford named Charles Taylor. And Taylor also rushed to the Geniza too late. Uh, now we have something called the Schechter Taylor Collection because after their deaths, the curators of both university libraries uh, put their stuff together. But Taylor and other scholars were very, very eager to get to the Geniza. And I think that Schechter is not being um, careless here. I think he's throwing them off the stuff. I'm going to take questions at the end because uh, it's already 30 and we have a, a lot more to go. So write down your questions with we'll these at the end. Okay. So he writes that they come from the Palestine um, bundle. We're not exactly sure whether that's intentional. I think it might have been. Look, it's all speculation, so we're going to keep going. <clears throat> and when he goes to the Geniza, he's there for between three and four weeks, his wife begins to correspond with Mayor Salzburger, their good friend in Philadelphia. Uh, because Schechter, you know, in those days, you can just hop on Southwest. It, this is a very hard journey. He can't correspond. Uh, with his friend, and so Stolzberger is sending correspondence, tell me more about this Geniza, and so Matilda picks up her pen, and she is writing, um, she is writing on behalf of Chucker, and I absolutely love what she says, um, and this is in December 1896, I love this letter, because uh, you know those very uh, ebullient Jewish ladies who always say, oh, I shouldn't tell you anymore, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's really secret, <laughs> okay, so that's basically what this letter is, uh, Mr. Schachter, I mean, there's such intrigue. There's such intrigue. He clearly told her, don't tell anyone where I'm going. That's great. <laughs> Mr. Schachter left England on the 16th of December for the East, right? That was like the Orient. You could totally say that in those days. Egypt and Palestine, where he was sent to by our university for purposes of research. Hebrew manuscripts, right? <laughs> <laughs> As it is a secret mission. Come on, guys. Don't you love this? Secret mission, the fact will be announced in the university reporter, like a newsletter, like a Harvard Crimson, or isn't that, what's the name of the Harvard newsletter? I don't know. Only after the commencement of next term, about the, about the end of January, 
when he will already have secured permission, so she's very confident this all can work out, and it actually does work out, to work in the oil and as otherwise his plans might have been defeated, right? If they publish about his adventures too early, his plans might be defeated because there's going to be a real crush of scholars who are fighting over the material, she knows that, caused by his discovery. She gives her husband all the credit, also like totally stereotypical, like, oh, my husband. What about those two Scottish identical twins? Okay. Caused by his discovery of the Ecclesiasticus fragment. So she's very enthusiastic. She's bursting with desire to tell him more. And she basically tells him everything that she knows, right? But it's a secret mission. We can't publish anything yet because then his plans might have been defeated. So I think that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I want to go back now before we move on to, um, and hopefully we'll have some time to actually talk about what was in the Geniza. To go back to this source from number two, this article, a fragment of the original text of Ecclesiasticus, because Schachter is very clear about what's at stake. And uh, sometimes scholars are not clear about polemics. They argue for something very strongly, but they don't explain why it's important. And in this very first article where he mentions the existence of the Ben Sierra fragment, he's totally up with his reader. Look, here's why this is important. Here's why I need to prove that the original version of Ben Sira was in Hebrew. My whole career uh, hinges on this. Look at, uh, look at four. Four and two, it's from the same article. And he tells his reader, totally a point. If it could be proved that Sirach, some believe in the rabbinic idiom, right, the rabbis called Sirach, or Sirach, with which we are acquainted from the Talmudic literature, then between Ecclesiasticus and the books of the Old Testament, there must lie centuries, this is a little hard, but bear with me, Nay, there must lie in some cases the deep waters of the captivity. What's the captivity? Exile. The grave of the old Hebrew and the old Israel and the womb of the new Hebrew and the new Israel. The assumption, by the way, I think those quotation marks are my mistake. Take those out. The whole thing is a quote. The assumption of Maccabean Psalms and many other hypotheses of Bible criticism would fall to the ground. Okay. So you have to know that in the 1880s and 1890s, this is the heyday of uh, scholars like Bernard Doom, D-U-H-M, uh, Julius Wellhausen, scholars who argued that the Hebrew Bible was not as great as people had assumed. It was, um, it was in, uh, written over many, many centuries by different communities, right? There was the J community, the Yahwehs, and there were the Elohists, the E, and there were the P's, right? the priestly guys, and there was the D, the Deuteronomist community. Not even just like J person, E person, but communities of people who edited these texts over time, and then it was later sewn together. And Chapter really felt, as do people even today, that this undermined the integrity, however it came about. I don't think that Schechter said every single line of the Torah was written by God himself, but Schechter really felt that this approach really uh, undermined the integrity of the Hebrew Bible. He didn't like it at all, and he felt that they, um, these same scholars weren't doing the same kind of text criticism or source criticism to the New Testament. Uh, so uh, at the same time that scholars are <clears throat> uh, divvying up the Pentateuch and attributing passages to different authors, they're taking what looks like more uh, philosophical biblical texts and saying, oh, these are very, very late. They're Hellenized. So Psalms was one of these books that many scholars said, oh, these were written in the Maccabean era, in 175 BC. Because these Psalms look very philosophical, they look very sophisticated, they must have been written very, very late. Schechter did not like this. He felt it was very circular. You don't say, oh, a text must have been written late because it was sophisticated, therefore any sophisticated text was written late. He didn't like this at all. So he says, if we can prove the antiquity of Ben Sira and the fact that it's written in Hebrew in the same Hebraic style of other older Hebrew biblical texts, then we can argue for the integrity of those older Hebrew texts. A little confusing, but are you with me? Okay. All right, so he's very upfront here. And I don't know if he succeeded. I mean, I think this is still an ongoing issue, like I mentioned in scholarship, but, but really, the discovery of, um, of Ben Sira in Hebrew, I don't know that it successfully combated his interlocutors in Germany and England, but certainly gave way to, I think, the greatest discovery of uh, Jewish artifacts ever, ever made. And, uh, oh no, no signal. I don't want to get back to that picture. Is there a way to get back to the picture? Is there a way? Oh, okay, great. 
Okay, so I want to tell you, this is a very famous passage, and I think probably some of you are familiar with it. I want to tell you how he describes, he, he just doesn't see this little bunch, right? He sees a room, and he dies of emphysema, a room just of, that's important because he inhaled these dusty, dusty documents. He spent his life studying these documents. Um, there's this little hole, right, that goes into this room of the Gniza, and he's not just saying this, he's saying this times 10,000, right, an entire room of jumbled up texts, <coughs> yeah, and dusty, and just, you, had, it, you would risk ruining the parchment by peeling them apart, you didn't know to, where to start. So look at how he describes, this is 1908, so a long time after he, uh, by this time he has, shipped the contents of the of the Geniza in crates to the University of Cambridge, but they have not been studied, most of them. I mean, he gets to a tiny percentage of what's there, but they're in crates and they're in the Geniza. We'll see what happens to them later. And so he talks in this 1908 article about um, what he saw the very first time that he entered the Geniza. So, <coughs> go to the end of the fourth line. I have already indicated, do you see that? I've already indicated, and the fourth line, verse, uh, source five. I've already indicated the mixed nature of the Geniza, but one can hardly realize the confusion in a genuine old Geniza until one has seen it. It's very, very poetic. It gets a little hard, though. It is a battlefield of books. Hold that metaphor. It is a battlefield of books. And the literary production of many centuries had their share in the battle, and their disjecta membra, their different body parts, are now strewn over its area. Some of the belligerents have perished outright. And isn't that nice? It's good, right? And are literally ground to dust in the terrible struggle for space, whilst others, as if overtaken by a general crush, are squeezed into big, unshapely lumps, kind of like this which even with the aid of chemical appliances can no longer be separated without serious damage to their constituents. In their present condition, these lumps sometimes afford curiously suggestive combinations. So this is fine. Okay, don't lose me here, because this is interesting. As, for instance, when you find a piece of some rationalistic work in which the very existence of either angels or devils is denied. So some text that says there's no such thing as angels or devils. Clinging for its very life to an amulet, right, ironic, in which these same beings are bound over to be on their good behavior and not interfere with Miss Yair or Jair's love for somebody. Right? So you have one attack that's denying the existence of an angel that's attached an amulet, praying to the angels to help her find true love. <laughs> I mean, this is great. Yeah. And then he says, the development of the romance is obscured by the fact that the last lines of the amulets are mounted on an IOU. Right? So really just no disorganization. Over the centuries, people just toss things in there. And they just lay there. Nothing was organized. And so that's a really uh, poetic way of describing the chaos, but still, you know, it is chaos. I just want to um, make mention of this last source. I don't, I don't really have time to go into it. But one of the people who was really interested in building his own personal collection of Geniza texts and not letting them all go to Cambridge under Schachter's jurisdiction was a British intellectual, a lawyer, uh, and an antiquities collector named Alcon Adler. And so I have something over here where he writes, oh, I got some Geniza stuff. <coughs> and he says, oh, but I didn't open up my boxes until just this past March. And he's running in 1900. So uh, you, can, you can look at that on your own. But basically, he wants a part in this process of discovery, but he didn't publish anything. So he had this stuff. Actually, Elkhan Adler went into financial distress. Apparently, there was an embezzlement. He was a very wealthy lawyer, and he's part of a very prominent family. And, um, and he lost all of his money through some embezzlement scheme. And he had to sell this entire collection, a few thousand ancient documents, to JTS, where they are today. JTS has the Elkhan Adler collection. OK, so now let's go back to do some slides. And then, well, maybe if we have time, we'll look at some text from the Cairo Geniza. All right, so what do I have here? I have to remember. Okay, a century's worth of work. A century's worth of work. A century's work of worth. Worth of work. Okay, so here we have all these little documents that are labeled, right? The person who's responsible for going through really isn't Schechter. I mean, 
mean, Schechter actually died in the 60s, and like I said before, probably because he had so much dust in his lungs, and he poured over those texts really for the rest of his life. He ended up going to JTS, he spent the last leg of his career at JTS. Uh, but his, his passion was always the Gamiza. And uh, there's a very famous picture of him pouring over the documents at that table with the boxes all around him of the Gamiza you can find it online. I think it's probably on his Wikipedia page. It's very famous picture, but, uh, but really the person who is very, very much responsible for publishing and organizing everything is Professor Shlomo Dov Gotai. Have you heard of him? A professor at the Hebrew University in the middle of the century. He writes all these um, <coughs> all these books. It's a multi-volume book actually, Mediterranean Society, and basically these books are readers of uh, meaning it just typed up documents from the Kinesa, but he has a little explanation at the beginning. And uh, he gave his life. His years are 1900 to 1985, so really shortly after Schachter dies, he picks up the mantle, and he's, uh, like I said, uh, he's born in Europe, but he spends his career at Hebrew University, and he is the Kinesa scholar of the 20th century. Um, so you should know his name. Okay, now as, um, as the Gnisa begins to be published, first of all, it just opens up a huge, uh, an, an entire field for scholars to study, um, and just a window into you know, the, an entire millennium of documents. And so what ends up happening is that by the 1970s, 1980s, there's not just one person dominating the, the category of Gnisa, uh, but it's splintering off, and so we begin to have you know, many, today we have many scholars of the Gnisa documents, and uh, those scholars are involved in many different fields, right? Some are involved in, in poetry, in, 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 um, in piyut, and others are involved, or others are Rambam scholars, who know the, the personal letters that Rambam wrote. Um, actually, the documents of the Gnisa are related to the Dead Sea Scrolls, to, I had to say the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, because one of the most interesting documents found in the Gnisa is, um, is called the, um, well, Shakhtar called it a Sadducean document. Um, it's not the community rule. Why am I blanking? A yeah. uh, Damascus document. So, the Damascus, so the, uh, this is called the Damascus document in, the 19, in 1948 when it's found in the Dead Sea caves. But uh, first it's called a Seda Dyke. The Zeta Dyke. Right. Because you're thinking of Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs> so and the Ginsburg. Uh, this document, uh, at first, um, Schachter thought maybe this was written by Sadducees. Maybe they were affiliated with Samaritans. He really didn't know. They seemed to have a very specific set of purity laws. They seemed to be very, very devoted to, um, to biblical scripture. But there's evidence of some kind of oral law as well. Uh, nobody really knew what to do with this document until it was found again in the Dead Sea caves. And so now scholars think that this was something composed by the Dead Sea, by the Dead sea staff. How did it end up in the Gnesis? It's one of these incredible, enduring mysteries. Uh, but so my point is that even Dead Sea scholars have something to do with the Gnesis, that it spans so many different fields. <clears throat> so now, um, as we're wrapping up, I just want to show you some text. Um, the screen isn't so big, but you can see, I mean, this is a, a sheet of Ramam's Mishnah Torah. So you can see this actually is in quite excellent condition. And you can actually online, <clears throat> if you go to this website, you can zoom in and you can really see, you can even see the lines that were made. Uh, and the quality is really outstanding. Now, not all documents are this beautiful, right? Um, so we also have this. <laughs> Scholars think that this is just a sheet of writing exercises because uh, there are lines from Yudah Levi's poems that are just written over and over and over. So somebody who's practicing his Hebrew script. Uh, there's also, the other side of it says goat in Arabic over and over. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, one of the most interesting things is uh, the concept of palimpsests. You know what palimpsests are? So in the ancient world, uh, scrolls and Parchment, they were very expensive. It was hard to cure leather. They were expensive. So instead of purchasing new parchment, often what scribes would do is they would take an old text that they no longer needed and they would scratch out the ink with like a little, not a blade, but a little metal, something sharp, like let's say a coin, and scratch out the ink. And they would write over that text. That's called a palimpsest. So the fourth century Bible that Agnes Smith Lewis found in Syriac was a palimpsest. It, um, it shared, uh, the text written over it was uh, a homage to female saints written in the 7th century. 
So palimpsest is now, uh, scholars uh, can deal with these texts very well because you, uh, they have laser imaging technology and there are different ways to really be very careful with the text and kind of read what was written under. Um, and just, uh, just this past summer, there's something called the Ein Gedi scroll that was found in, an, in a cave in Ein Gedi that's a copy of Leviticus, but it's, I don't know if you read about this, Mark Brettler wrote an article about it. Um, so I believe it's a palimpsest. <coughs> And so this is not a palimpsest, but there were many of them found in the Karganiza. And when Schechter found the Geniza, um, in 1896, there was very little you could do with the palimpsest. You could see that letters were scratched out, but without ruining the text, you really couldn't, you, you really wouldn't be able to decipher the text. Okay. All right, so here we have a Kara a Ketubah. I thought that was pretty cool. And also it's dated, so that's fun. 1028, amazing. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up. And look at, I also have on the source sheet a few documents, but it's 847. So let's look at a couple things, and then I'll wrap up by 855, let's say, and then we'll look at questions. Okay, so what do I have here? I'm not going to do all four of these, um, these texts, but you know, it would be fun. Let's start with the last one, because this is a personal letter. There is a lot of halakhic material, a lot of legal material preserved in the Giza. Um, I forgot to say something very important. I mentioned that the Geniza has a lot of documents without God's name on it. Why would that be? Most of the documents have, uh, are written in Hebrew. A few aren't, actually. Some are written in Judeo-Persian and Arabic, but mostly they're in Hebrew. So scholars, um, especially there's a scholar at the University of Haifa, Moshe Levi, who's written a lot about <clears throat> the, the um, Hebrew uh, found in the Karaganiza, and he starts out, uh, many of his articles, he mentions the fact that for these Jews, I mean, why did they throw out these documents? Personal letters, right? Poems, why did they save all this stuff? For these Jews, Hebrew was so sacred that you couldn't throw it out. It wasn't a question, like today, of whether you have God's name on it. My kids are so firm, they go to Art Crown. If they write G-D on a piece of paper, they'll give it to me. They'll say, can you put it in there? No, I'm going to throw it out. <laughs> I'm a real good example to my kids. I really, I'm carrying the banner of our crap. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, so no, it wasn't about God's name. It was about the language of Hebrew it had such power, it had such sanctity for these Jews that it must be that they felt if it's written in Hebrew, we are not comfortable throwing it out. So that's actually a very interesting and a very different mindset from today. Um, Hebrew for them was a language that they used to express piety, even if they weren't specifically mentioning God. Um, and even if it wasn't an inherently um, religious text. So that's an important, uh, an important detail to mention. So look at this last, <clears throat> this last letter that is so uh, poignant and passionate and uh, it's just a personal letter that a man who was traveling uh, on the road and missed his wife and wrote her a letter and somehow it ended up in the Guineas. I mean, really, really personal stuff. So of course we have to exploit this person and read it out loud together. <laughs> um, so now that I've taken up the entire hour, anybody want to volunteer but somebody with a loud voice? Just the last verse. I have sworn an oath not to wash the clothes I wear until I return to you nor cut my hair, drink wine, or enter a bath until I come home. All right, Nazarite vow. <laughs> He's just not going to clean himself up. Yeah. People know how I am constantly weeping, crying out, and sobbing. By the Torah of Moses, peace upon him, I have not forgotten you, nor have I ever replaced you with someone else, or forgotten your piety and love. May God not let me die out of desire for you. I mean, isn't that amazing? Is that, who writes like that anymore? May God not let me die out of desire for you. That's like Shakespearean. I mean, that's really unbelievable. Yeah, keep going, please. I entreat you not to forget me in your prayers. I wish to treat you with kindness. May God fulfill my hopes in this regard. I ask that I should be able to be decked with jewels beyond every woman in Sicily. So we have a, little, a nice little clue over here of where this couple comes from. Right, but how it ended up in the Geniza, and there are lots of documents in the Geniza that are, were not written in Cairo. We do not know, I mean, this, as I said, an enduring scholarly mystery. How did all these documents get there? Um, so this is really a nascent field. It's really a rising field. If you ever want to get a PhD, just do it now. Get it in the Geniza, because there's so much, no, but really, there's so much, um, so much work to be done. The, the past century has just really been a century of organizing and cataloging and identifying. Okay, this is a 12th century text, right? Comes from like you can even go onto the website, 
or I have it on the, on the source sheet. And you can see that um, a lot of the documents online are identified. And some of them are, see how that has a, how, some of them aren't, but you can see, um, it's not on the PowerPoint. To the right of the photograph, you'll see information about the document. But a lot of what's been digitized doesn't have that information up yet. So it's an emerging field. And the next century will really learn a lot more, I think, about the, the world that the Geniza represents that is largely lost to us. So this is a little window into uh, the, the discovery or the rediscovery of the, of the Geniza. And uh, now I'll take questions, and I hope that you come back next week as we learn about the Dead Sea Scrolls. I will not insult the Dead Sea Scrolls next week. I'm going to pretend like that's the coolest discovery ever in the history of Judaism, right? Because that's what will be happening next week. So any questions or comments? Yeah, please. Two quick questions. First, first one, do it short. What, what, when was the uh, personal letter from? So I don't know that it's dated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, um, but see here, you could actually put that into the website, and it'll give you whatever information. If I didn't put the date there, they might not provide it. Right. Yeah. Second question is, what's the proportion of different materials, like paper, papyrus, parchments? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, papyri, you really know, because that fell out of use, you know, in the, in the rabbinic. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, it is Egypt, so in the ancient world, Jews did use papyri because it was cheap, right, right? and because it lasted in a dry climate. But uh, by the time the Gnese is founded in the 9th century, 10th century, uh, Jews aren't really using papyri anymore. Yeah, so mainly paper, but there are, you know, there, there are scrolls as well. Yeah, but, but then again, I mean, largely you can make the distinction uh, between scriptural texts that are written on, on parchment, like today, right? And then plain documents like contracts and personal letters that are written on regular paper. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised that the um, owner, or the, the rabbi and the shamash of the of the Kedis of it um, didn't recognize that the wealth of information, or, or if they did, didn't keep it in better shape. Is there any speculation as to why it was disregarded for so long? I don't know. It is true that they didn't take care of the contents of the Geniza, but they knew that it was a very, very precious treasure. And there were many legends that circulated over the centuries about what would happen to you if you went into the Geniza without official permission. Uh, serpents would bite you and you would die horrible deaths. I mean, there were a lot of legends that I think were put into circulation because they didn't want people snooping around the Geniza. And you weren't allowed to go into the Geniza without official permission. Most people weren't allowed to go in. Um, so on the one hand, they did have this kind of like um, hex on the, it's not the right word, but they, they did have this idea that the Geniza is off limits, right? The Geniza is a special place that they, they knew was a, a, a local treasure. Um, and it could be for that very reason that even the administrators of the synagogue themselves didn't really go in. Um, so I'm not sure, yes, things were tossed in there. I'm not sure that reflects a lack of regard um, because they really did not really want the Geniza. They, yeah, the, there were a, a lot of, the, there were, it's actually amazing that Schechter made it as far as he did. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems like in terms of the way the community treated it, that it's not at all very much dissimilar from the community that had the Aleppo Codex in terms of not letting yeah. people in, not letting them photograph it, not letting it leave. Well, yeah, and there's a lot of cultural suspicion of foreigners who just come in and say, all right, this is mine. Um, and not just with Jewish communities, but Greek Orthodox communities as well. In the Sinai Desert, uh, the St. Catherine's monks um, consider the, not the Syriac Sinaiticus, but the Codex Sinaiticus, found by Constantine van Tischendorf in the 1850s. They regard that as stolen. Have you heard of Tischendorf? Very famous antiquities collector, Christian, uh, German, and he claimed that he had permission to take it out on loan, somehow it never ended up back in the monastery. But, um, but there are these stories, you know, of especially in the second half of the 19th century, of Jews and Christians coming to these places that had guarded their sacred treasures for years, centuries and centuries and centuries, and uh, some of these transactions were not mutual. And even today, there are, um, there are monasteries in Ethiopia where they don't allow foreigners in, because they don't trust them. And to me, it's pretty legitimate, I mean, given the history of how we've come into these documents, 
right? There's a very, very controversial museum now in Washington, D.C. that just opened the Bible Museum. And there's a big question of how did some of these artifacts come into the possession of the people who started this museum, the Green family. So this is like an ongoing controversy. And yes, it's the, you can see with the Aleppo Codex, Monty Friedman's book is an amazing account of that. You can see it um, with the story of how uh, scholars got text out of St. Catharines, does not seem to be a mutual transaction. And there's a, a peninsula in Greece called Mount Athos. Mount Athos has 20, 20 monasteries. They're all early medieval. They all have their own ancient library. And these monks are very protective of their libraries. They do not like foreigners coming in. They don't, um, I, I mean, this is a, a really, really challenging relationship. The relationship between scholars and the preservers of ancient texts. And it's very sensitive. And so, again, going back to Schechter, how he endeared himself to this community, it, it was the exception to the rule. Okay, uh, yes, and then yes. Has anything been discovered from the Geniza yet that has challenged or put into question today's modern canon of texts, such as different <coughs> translations or um, interpretations? If no, is it just because it's too new? Or it's still too nascent and they haven't gotten to any... Is the, question, is the question whether there are biblical versions that diverge from the Masoretic yes. text? Yes. So I'm not enough of a scholar to know, but I think that there are variants. I think that there are variants. Uh, a lot of this is not yet published. Yeah, I wish I had more information for you. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not a scholar uh, um, of Bible manuscripts from the Kinesa, but I'm pretty sure there are variants. Yeah. One day, it hasn't been done yet, but one day a scholar will publish the Bible of the Geniza, right? The biblical version, uh, or the biblical versions that are found in the Geniza, but that hasn't been published yet. Yeah, please. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm sure there were other Genizas in other communities. Right. Was it, was it uh, particular because Cairo was such a uh, central uh, uh, location in the Near East, or was it declining <coughs> also? I mean, I mean, there were a lot of dusty Genizas in <coughs> attics in Europe that just because of the right. mildew and stuff like that. Right. So, I mean, what are you thinking on that? Yeah, at some point, and, and pretty early on, it took on a, a well-known reputation that people knew about this reason. We have evidence in <clears throat> the 17 and 1800s, for sure, probably earlier, that people knew about this reason. They were, they were intrigued by the Geniza, but they didn't feel like they had any access to the Geniza. So it does seem to be unique in, in its size and in its just how long it lasted. We also haven't done excavation. We don't know of Genesis that are that old that is one in of them one Italy, actually. Um, in Afghanistan. Yes. I was about to say that, so Sadly. I'm getting there. Getting there. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so, okay, I'll get there right now. <laughs> so, um, in 2013, there was basically on the side of a cliff found, uh, there was a cave in Afghanistan, and uh, scholars now do not think that this was a Geniza as much as a personal collection by a Jew who lived along the trade route that went to China, and he was a wealthy merchant, and they have his uh, personal letters. Whether this is a Geniza, it probably, it was not a Geniza, probably these are his personal documents. Uh, Hebrew University, no, the National Library of Israel bought them uh, in 2014, and they have not all been published yet. Uh, I wouldn't call that a Geniza. Um, it's not, certainly doesn't compare in size to the Cairo Geniza, and it all seems to be from a specific three decades. So sort of stored by this family. So I, it was very sensationalist when this first came out. The, the Afghan Geniza, you could Google it and you'll see you know, all this stuff coming up in news outlets. There's an Afghan Geniza. No, I would be very careful to label it a Geniza, uh, but we have to wait and see on that. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about maybe 50 texts. Yeah, yeah so it's interesting. Did you tell them about the, uh, I'm, I'm a member of one of the articles about the year 1000. It's a medieval. Geniza, the person, and it's all Judeo-Arabic. So again, it's not like these are religious texts written in Hebrew. It's of a different nature than the Cairo Geniza, and we'll have to see, you know, what scholars end up doing with that. Uh, and then, like I was saying, uh, with other Geniza uh, in Europe, I don't think that we have anything on the scale of the Cairo Geniza. So at some point, the Cairo Geniza became well known as a place where you, yeah. But again, it doesn't really explain the question of how does someone writing a letter to his wife in Sicily how does this letter make it to the Knees? I mean, we really don't know, and that makes it all the more intriguing. I mean, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, it's pretty clear that in the first century, the people living at Qumran, right, just a 10-minute walk from the caves, stored their documents, their library, in this arid climate. It made a lot of sense, right? But the Knees is, you know, much more mysterious. Okay, other questions, comments? It's 9 o'clock. All right, well, I'm here, and uh, thank you so much. Next week, I'm just